You're listening to the Bloom Europa podcast, a project that privileges new and independent thinking on Europe while discussing its current challenges. In each episode, we take a holistic but hard-hitting approach to analysing pan-European affairs. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bloom Europa podcast. My name is Carlos Montenegro. And I'm Adarito Vicente. And we are your hosts for today's show. So in our third episode, we will talk about how effective are sanctions against Russia with Dr. Daniel Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton is a senior non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution Center on the United States and Europe, and also a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. He also serves as president of the Transatlantic Leadership Network, a nonpartisan international network of practitioners, private sector leaders, and policy analysts dedicated to strengthening and reorienting uh, transatlantic relations to rapidly changing dynamics of a globalizing world. In addition to these activities, he is also the author of more than 100 books and articles on contemporary European transatlantic international affairs. Furthermore, we would like to remind our audience that this episode was recorded on the 9th of June, 2022, and all the events that we talk about it are associated until that date. Hi, Dr. Hamilton. Many thanks for joining us. We are very pleased to have you here. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. So let's start. Um, after the Kremlin sent troops to Ukraine on February 24 this year, Western governments and close partners such as Japan, South Korea, Australia, or Singapore, not to name at all, have introduced unprecedented financial and economic sanctions against Russia. They have shown close coordination in their announcements, as for example, the sanctions against Moscow Central Bank or the removal of other financial institutions from SWIFT. Yet they have not moved at the same pace when it comes to Russian oil and gas. Uh, Russia and Ukraine are major commodity producers, while Russia is the world's top natural gas exporter and second largest uh, oil exporter. Ukraine and Russia are among the world's breadbaskets. For example, they supply around 30% of the world's wheat and barley. We can say at this point that due to the war on Ukraine, food costs have soared considerably across the world with particularly dramatic impacts on developing countries. In addition, rising prices in energy altogether led to the highest rates of inflation in the last four decades. So let's uh, start our conversation by asking this. Uh, looking historically to the applied uh, financial and economic sanctions, and I'm thinking about Cuba, Iran, or more recently, Venezuela, with all the, of course, obvious differences on models, sizes, and spectrum, I would like to ask you, if, do you think that the block of financial and economic measures applied against Russia will achieve their goal, or, and, as it was questioned by Richard Haas in June 1, 1998, economic sanctions are too much of a bad thing. Uh, well, thank you. <clears throat> I mean, the examples you listed were all uh, with relatively small countries um, and uh, targeted uh, you know, over a certain period of time. Uh, these sanctions are really in terms of their size, in terms of the speed in which they were put together in terms of the sheer scope of them are really unprecedented. Uh, it's really the first time ever that, uh, at least since World War II, uh, that uh, a, a major country uh, such as Russia has been the subject of such a unprecedented uh, set of sanctions. It's not just the sanctions, of course, there are lots of other things that, that these countries are doing to Russia. So when you say do sanctions achieve their goal, uh, what is the goal? 
uh, the goal, uh, as these countries have expressed it, is to punish Russia. So clearly, they're achieving that goal. Russia is being punished pretty severely in terms of the range of sanctions that have been imposed. Uh, the Russian economy probably will uh, go down by maybe 10 to 15 percent this year. Uh, collapse that basically that wipes out basically 15 years of economic uh, progress in Russia. Um, yeah, all sorts of uh, um, uh, uh, products and, and you know components to products are being denied to Russia. So uh, that will bite over time, but many parts of the Russian economy won't be able to function uh, that depend on foreign uh, you know materials and components. Uh, the the oil and gas embargoes are going to have their effect, although, as you say, Russia still sells that to other countries, but still uh, having major uh, customers now not agreeing to uh, to take Russian energy is is at least causes a major disruption to the economy. Mm -hmm. um, the Russian, the central bank uh, uh, issues are probably the worst. The assets of the Russian central bank being frozen, half of them at least. Uh, this is hundreds of billions of dollars uh, that are at stake here. Uh, you know, half of Russian gold and foreign exchange reserves, uh, you know, $300 billion, uh, really uh, untouchable. Uh, this is good. This is having already an effect, but it's going to have more of an effect as time goes on. Mm -hmm. So the immediate question you asked, you know, do they work? They, they work. The goal was to punish Russia. Mm -hmm. The goal was not to say, get out of Ukraine through the sanctions only. So if we understand what the goal was as announced, clearly they're having an effect. Mm -hmm. uh, we could discuss, of course, you know, are we having success with Russia in, mm -hmm. in terms of, of its war on Ukraine, but that's a different question. That's a different question, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for your reply. Uh, and as you referred, we, we have been witnessing an unprecedented level in terms of the, the size and the, the, the scope and the speed of the applied sanctions mm -hmm. uh, by the, the Western governments. Uh, and we, we also, th there was an interesting uh, approach that we, we never saw this before. And I, I think it's the, the, this flow of massive global private sector reaction that provoked uh, an ongoing divestment wave in Russia going beyond, much beyond the, the, the scope of the financial and economic sanctions. And in, in, taking this in, into mind, you know, and you, you already touched a bit on, on this next question, the, what would be, what, what are the effects of the economic sanctions internally? Uh, I would I would add a, a, a second sub question that that is and considering the the Russian regime internal narrative to explain the war, uh, do you think that uh, the sanctions are helping to shift public opinion against Putin and steering Russians into political action to protest the war, or on a medium long term they will have the effect of solidifying Putin's position? Yeah, well, the effect internally, again, it takes some time for these sanctions to be felt, you know, uh, severely, uh, but certainly uh, consumers are finding things aren't on the shelves. The, as I said, companies are finding uh, that they are, some of their products are, they can't produce because they're so reliant on these inputs. Uh, a thousand companies, a thousand companies have disinvested from Russia, left Russia. Yeah. Uh, which of course disrupts the economy tremendously. Some of them have been selling, selling you know, their assets to Russian, uh, you know, um, customers, if you will, who will then maybe uh, continue at those companies. But again, the, the disruption here is massive, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll we'll have to see over time what it means. So far, it has not translated into any widespread social. Uh, you know, protests, but of course, one has to keep in mind that uh, Russian security forces are also on the watch for that. And they have, they, when the first protests did emerge in February, uh, they immediately suppressed them. Mm -hmm. And they have jailed any number of opposition leaders uh, and, and normal just protesters. So, uh, you know, there's another factor here besides just whether people are disgruntled, uh, they're in fear. Uh, it's hard to know exactly, but most opinion polls, it's hard to really understand how legitimate those opinion polls are, but there doesn't seem to be any massive um, uh, turn away from Putin at the moment. The narrative 
uh, that somehow this is a justified uh, war seems to at least take hold in the minds of uh, an, a significant percentage of Russians. It's hard to know how many. In Bonn, Germany, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen emphasized the importance of ensuring that the sanctions impose the maximum impact on Russia while trying to, and I quote now, minimize spillovers to ourselves. Do you think that U.S., Canada, and EU, EU governments are managing to do this proper balance? They, they're trying, but of course, much of the inflation that we're seeing uh, both in Europe and the United States is related to the energy Mm -hmm. issues. So high energy prices are helping to fuel the inflation that we're seeing. So they're not escaping, you know, uh, blowback to our own economies uh, in that regard. Uh, of course, um, some countries are dependent on um, oil and gas. And so they've been trying to manage this. The EU, you know, has actually been very ambitious in terms of trying to wean itself off of Russian energy, but a couple EU countries simply are really almost 100% dependent. And so there are carve outs. And so that, that'll take some time, but I think it's been impressive, at least to me, that the EU is actually doing this. Um, I, I think what you also see is that the United States is becoming a major energy partner for Europe in a way that uh, one didn't discuss that really uh, just some years ago. It's becoming the largest LNG provider, uh, liquefied natural gas provider to Europe. Uh, and in, starting in February, uh, US LNG supplies to Europe exceeded Russian natural gas pipeline deliveries to Europe. Uh, that's major. Uh, and while the United States isn't going to replace you know, all those other sources of energy for Europe, it's becoming an, an important partner. And that underscores how linked our economies are also in the energy space. Uh, it's not just the fossil uh, fuel world either, uh, but it's also the green transition, the Green New Deal, you know, fossil free energies as well. The United States and Europe are becoming increasingly interconnected in ways that, uh, again, are very new. And, and Russia is going to become a non-factor. Uh, so if you say, do these things work, they're, what they're doing is making a major transition in the way our economies are going to work in the future. Mm -hmm. The largest contractors for long-term renewable energy uh, in terms of wind and you know, solar, companies you know, uh, uh, make advanced purchasing uh, deals they, you know, for long-term contracts for these. Now, five of the top 10 in Europe are US companies. Okay. Uh, and so the Green Deal in Europe isn't going to happen without U.S. companies being part of it. And the same is true the other way. It's not just a one-way flow. The, great, the largest invest, investors in the U.S. energy economy are European companies. Uh, and it's not just the fossil fuel industry. It's, it's the new industries as well. Uh, so we're becoming interconnected, not just in terms of our you know, basic economy, but in this new field. Um, so I just think that's an interesting development that seems to be escaping some attention, uh, but it'll become quite critical. Uh, and that'll help uh, ameliorate, uh, lessen you know, the, the pain, if you will. Uh, I think what we've seen is how resilient our economies are. We're going through much pain, uh, you know, not just the, the sanctions, of course, the energy issues, but of course the pandemic, other, other issues, congested supply chains, but so, so far, our economies have proven resilient to that, and I think they'll withstand it. But, but it is a painful exercise. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, in this context, uh, you know, what you discussed, while unity strengthens uh, the Euro-Atlantic Euro community in imposing uh, sanctions against Russia or in aiding Ukraine, uh, China looks like to align more closely with Russia. So, uh, you know, playing a bit uh, devil's advocate. So, as we know, most of the, of, the, um, of the countries in Asia, Latin America and Africa, while critical of the Russian aggression, for instance, uh, at the UN General Assembly, you know, they do not sanction nor cut economic and trade ties with Russia. So that, that's, that's an issue. So the current security environment has been uh, deteriorating due to the growing perception 
of this uh, greater power realignment that pits the existing uh, US-led Western dominant liberal international order against uh, this new kind of uh, revisionist powers led by Beijing and Moscow. Do you think that Western uh, sanctions will be less effective in this new uh, context and in this new environment uh, of, uh, let, let us say, of, uh, of aspiring uh, of a new world order? What, what do you think? Well, I'm cautious about terms like that. Um, I, th I do agree with your point that uh, I think the United States, Europe, other countries uh, should do a better job uh, in much of the world explaining what the stakes are in Ukraine. Uh, that it's not about Ukraine uh, or some you know European struggle, uh, or it's not something you know it's just sort of a first world issue, uh, which I think one hears in a number of countries. Uh, if, you know, Mr. Putin says he has a duty to protect and defend Russian speakers or ethnic Russians uh, by force, uh, no matter where they live. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, that's a problem of basic rules. Uh, and if you took that basic principle uh, globally, with so many countries that have multi-ethnic populations, that's a recipe for chaos and, and violence and mayhem. Uh, that's, a, that's a big deal. It's not about Ukraine. Uh, if he weaponizes the, the world's food supply, which he's doing right now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, 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 the developing countries, those are dependent on those food imports are suffering because of Russia. Russia is uh, consciously weaponizing uh, food uh, and trying to, you know, create a narrative that somehow the West is doing that. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, the Ukrainians are desperately trying to get their grain out, but they can't because the Russians have mined the Black Sea uh, and aren't allowing it out. Uh, we should not forget that Putin has also weaponized refugees and migrants. Uh, in Syria, he, he did that. Uh, and disrupted Europe, you know, tremendously in 2015. Uh, I mean, that was a conscious, you know, policy choice to do these things. Uh, he's do done it again now in Ukraine. Uh, and, you know, uh, Mr. Lukashenko and Belarus did the same thing uh, just, you know, recently last year on the Polish border when he took four Afghan refugees and, you know, thrust them at the Polish border consciously. Uh, so this is, a, this is the new world order. We're, what we're seeing is we moved, Europe is probably the most dramatic case of where we move from a sense of relative stability to an age of disruption. And the great power competition that you mentioned is part of it, uh, but it's not, don't, it doesn't describe the real world uh, only. It's only a piece of it. Um, even this great power competition, you know, the China, ch challenge from China is somewhat different. It's a, China is a multi-dimensional challenge in lots of ways. It's a revisionist power, I would argue, but it's not a revanchist power. Russia has shown it's seeking revenge. It's about payback in Putin's mind. It's, it's, uh, it's dangerous. Uh, China presents a, a, a different set of challenges which we could discuss if you want. But that's embedded in this notion that uh, all, the, all, all the critical functions of our societies that keep us free and open and life you know, happens are now subject to disruptive threats. Uh, think about food and people, movement of food and people. Think of energy, uh, medicines. The pandemic is part of this. Uh, climate change, you know, uh, think about goods and services. We have congested supply chains. Uh, lots of things of these flows that are connecting us are being disrupted either by state actors, non-state groups, or even mother nature. And that's the kind of security world, I think world order, if you want to talk about it, that I think we need to think about how it's not just about protecting territory, it's protecting our connectedness, uh, because that can uh, that can be a serious security challenge these days. Exactly. So, you know, from what you said, uh, you, you mentioned uh, age of disruption. 
we are living in a age of disruption. So if we are living in that age, you know, uh, perhaps there is also a deterioration of norms. Therefore, sanctions as a product of those norms might be less effective as well. Well, I don't agree with that. I think it's about upholding your principles. Um, so sanctions are, in this case, uh, the, these countries are upholding their principles, again, saying we won't tolerate this. Uh, and we will use what we can to punish you if you try to invade a, a country like this and commit genocide. Uh, it's not acceptable. Uh, so it's, it is still about rules. But the 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 the, uh, the other side of the Ukraine conflict um, is showing the importance of resilience. So you know, if if we're in an age of disruption, we have, we're facing the disruption. What do we do? We have to build more resilient societies. And the Ukrainians are showing us how you do that. I mean, Ukrainian you know civilian resilience is impressive. They have been uh, you know the whole civil society, the whole country has risen up to support the military, but also simply to you know, do all sorts of things the Russians were unprepared for. Uh, and I think that's an important lesson for all of us as we think about how to uh, you know, deal with these disruptive challenges should they come our way. And it's not isolated. If you think about side the cyber world, uh, one example, a few years ago in the United States, there was what's called the solar winds attack. It was a disruptive attack on many U.S. companies and, and infrastructure. Uh, the precursor to that was the NotPetya attack in Ukraine. It was Russian operatives trying stuff out in Ukraine, using Ukraine as a laboratory for all sorts of disruptive levers and tools that they have. And the lesson we have found is if they think it works in Ukraine, they take it on the road. Uh, and uh, so Ukraine has you know, become a laboratory for this much bigger challenge. That's why, again, it matters to the rest of the world how we respond to the challenge uh, that we see there. Thank you. Thank you very much. So moving back to the commission, some, some, some weeks ago, the European Commission published its European Economic Forecast at, at the some point in the foreword has written the following, and I quote, the uncertainty around the baseline scenario is extreme and the balance of risks is skewed heavily towards unfavorable outcomes. An escalation of the war, a sudden stop of energy deliveries or a further deceleration of economic activity in the US and China could result in a much grimmer outlook. We have been talking a bit uh, during the, 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 our podcast about this. My, my question now is, Looking at the present stage of the conflict, are we uh, at the final escalate point of economic sanctions to de-escalate afterwards? Or do you think that they will last much longer the end of the, the, the conflict? Well, your question, your question presumes there's an end to the conflict. Yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't see that. Uh, I, I, this notion that so like generals like to ask for many you know, uh, opinion writers, when does this end? How does this end? Um, I don't think it ends. I don't see a scenario in which this ends. Okay. That's the problem. Uh, I don't think, I don't see any prospect. They're, they're negotiating uh, sporadically in Turkey, the Ukrainians and the Russians, and that's going mm -hmm. nowhere. I mean, I just posit to you, I don't see any scenario in which a Ukrainian president would agree to any settlement that signs away parts of Ukrainian territory to Russia. Mm -hmm. The Ukrainian people uh, will not stand for that. Uh, any president that did that would be out of office the next day. Of course. Uh, so there's no, there's no ability or willingness for Ukraine to submit to this aggression, uh, including the line of February 24th, which some suggest would be, they would be satisfied with that. Russia, you know, annexed the Crimean Peninsula, which is Ukrainian territory. It has, uh, by force, uh, you know, already invaded the country in 2014. Why, why would it, uh, why would this stop it from continuing this aggression? So I don't see it. And I don't see Mr. Putin agreeing to be evicted from Ukraine. Of course. 
uh, anytime soon. So the scenario I see, unfortunately, and I don't see the West while supporting Ukraine ready to start World War III, you know, to evict Russia. Uh, I just don't see that either. So if you put that together, what I see is a, uh, you know, a contested line of control cutting through Ukrainian territory based on where forces are on the ground that maybe with the ceasefire declared, but such a ceasefire probably would be broken all the time. There would be sporadic violence, each side seeking advantage. Uh, and that's not just, you know, on the land, we have to think of Ukraine in terms of the Black Sea as well. Uh, and also think of Russia's tactics, which have not been limited to Ukraine. Russian, you know, Russia did the same thing in 2008 in Georgia, the country of Georgia, with two separatist entities, uh, which it declared to be, you know, be people's republics. Nobody else agrees with that, but it's still there. Uh, they have forces in uh, all of the EU's Eastern Partnership countries have Russian forces, military forces on them, so much for the EU strategy. Uh, and this is a Russian tactic to destabilize and control and, and disrupt its neighborhood. So that's, that calls for continued turbulence, sporadic violence, and a number of festering wounds all through Eastern Europe. That's the Europe I see for the next decade, at least. Uh, and so I think one has to really start with the premise here. I don't see any de-escalation of any sanctions at all uh, anytime soon. Um, and, uh, but, but do you think, Professor, do you think under this... It's, it's not a great story, but it's the uh, Europe that I see. Okay. But do you think under this scenario, there is room for carving out more uh, financial sanctions? Do you think there is uh, still room yes, under the economic absolutely. outlook? There is room for that. Okay. Yes, we're on a scale, you know, we're, we're on an escalatory ladder of sanctions mm -hmm. and we're maybe at eight out of 10, mm -hmm. uh, but there's much more that could be done. Okay. And I think that the, these countries are prepared to keep ramping up the pressure uh, as we go forward. We're not done with the sanctions. Okay, okay. That was the, the baseline question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, another question we would like to, to ask is uh, one, one, one um, exactly one month after the invasion, you, you wrote a very interesting article tied with Europe and America geoeconomic base. Uh, you already talked a bit about this in uh, underlying this in the in this or in our podcast. And uh, I quote a sentence you, you, you wrote was uh, Putin's war is uncovering the impressive strength and resilience of the transatlantic economy. North America and Europe are not only bound together through the NATO Defense Alliance, the two sides of the North Atlantic remain each other's most important commercial partners and geoeconomic base. They can build on this foundation to isolate and punish Putin, address competitive challenge from China and capitalize on their deeply interconnected innovation links to make sure they remain global standard setters. You, you talked already uh, about this, but my question is, after more than, more than three months of conflict, your perception is that this relation is still rock solid, and what are the, the foundations for, for future? What, what can be done? No, absolutely. I, I think one has to distinguish between the short-term shocks and disruptions that are associated with the war. Uh, they're compounded, of course, by the pandemics continuing effects on our economies, uh, which, you know, they haven't gone away. Uh, and we're dealing with, you know, then the accumulated pain of all of that. So there, uh, there's no doubt there's pain here, uh, but we are, we are addressing the pain and the, the, the unity of all of these countries, despite those pressure points has been impressive, I think. Mm -hmm. We're all still quite unified on this. And so that's the, that's the current, but if you look at the deeper trends, then uh, I get, that's my point about the resilience of the transatlantic economy and our, us being each other's geoeconomic base. I mentioned the energy dynamic, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, last year before the war, so the last data we would have, US uh, European uh, commerce, trade and goods and services was 1.1 trillion euros. Uh, that's 42% more than the EU's trade with China. Uh, and yet often I hear in Europe, somehow everyone says China's Europe's most important trading partner. I mean, it's just factually wrong. 
uh, and so why 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 does the European you know commentary class keep saying that, and why do actually European EU governments even say it when it's just clearly factually incorrect? It's there's something strange there. Um, the United States remains Europe's fundamental economic partner in all all regards, uh, and that is a positive for us. <clears throat> And our companies tend to prefer to go across the Atlantic and set up shop, you know, the other side of the Atlantic, not just to trade things. So investment flows are even more important than trade. We're also the center of the digital world. Flows of digital, you know, digital flows, if you will, data flows across it in the, in the Atlantic are about 40% higher than in the Pacific. Uh, and so, and the, and the growth rates are higher as well. So, I don't see trends moving in other direction. In fact, what I see is people starting to worry about China. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see companies now either diversifying, uh, so uh, they're not gonna be reliant on you know, certain products just in one country. So this is, this is where we are and, and we, can, we can use that base uh, to become resilient to these challenges and to chart the future. I mentioned the economy. I think the real challenge we have and an opportunity is we're moving to a new economic model that's based on, you know, weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels and addressing our climate uh, challenges. That's a long-term challenge, but the climate uh, threat is approaching quickly. So the weaning ourselves or Europe off of dependence on Russia energy means frankly that Europe's creating new dependencies for itself in terms of clean technologies that are uh, dependent on critical materials located in lots of other countries, many of them unreliable uh, or it's China. So uh, as we try and make this transition, uh, will Europe wanna do that by itself uh, or wouldn't it wanna do it with an energy superpower that trying to help it? Uh, and again, where are, we are investing so much in each other's energy economies, I think we should be able to manage that shifting dependency together better than uh, each trying to do it on, on their own. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your reply. Uh, so not so long ago, uh, some European countries uh, with different economic interests continue to negotiate large trade and energy deals with Russia. This contrast, uh, contrasting uh, dual approach led to even if indirectly, the continuous funding of Moscow's aggression machine in Ukraine. For example, for example, despite the 2014 US embargo, according to a recent report, 10 EU member states, France, Germany, Italy, Aust Austria, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Croatia, Finland, Slovakia, and Spain, exported weapons to Russia until at least 2020. Uh, these countries relied on the use of a legal loophole in the EU regulations that allow the continuation of uh, arms exports. Um, so do you think that uh, while we witness uh, to the rising prices in energy and food markets across the world, but also in Europe, perhaps the EU member states like Hungary or even uh, uh, the countries uh, would use similar legal loopholes? or legal ambiguities to continue to do uh, business with Russia? Well, <clears throat> there's always the danger of companies trying to evade the sanctions, but I think the, the overall effort at the moment has been impressive and there's been little of that, at least within the West. I think the real question, will Chinese companies seek to go around the sanctions because China would become a much more important uh, partner for Russia than if, if so far, China has straddled the line, uh, not necessarily doing that, uh, but it, it, you know, that could change. If you think there might be fatigue in the West as the war continues, as in this never-ending conflict, as I mentioned, goes on, uh, there will be certainly pressure to get back to some business. Um, but again, we have to keep this in, in context. Russian Economy, you know, it's the size of Spain's economy. It is not a big economy. It's not critical to most countries in the world. It is mainly a commodity, you know, economy, uh, mainly energy, but also, as you mentioned, food and so on. So 
I think that's where the pressure points will be. Where are certain countries dependent on those flows of commodities from Russia? And will the pressure be so great that they need to get back you know, uh, on that? Uh, so far, the effort has been to cut off the dependence on the energy flows. That takes a little time, but that's the direction uh, everyone's going. Uh, cutting yourself off from food flows is not a question for Europe as much as it is for many developing countries. And that's again where the question is, what is the West prepared to do to help those countries with their food supplies? Uh, that should be part of the overall strategy is, is to show that we are not just punishing Russia, but we're helping other countries who are suffering from Russia's own invasion because we stand with them. I think that would be a big part of the puzzle going forward that, that would be important. Okay, great. No, thank you. Thank you so much indeed. So we will go to the to the last question without obviously during futuristic assessments. You you already touched a bit on these points about Cold War, future generations, you're special on this last last uh, uh, answer that we take, and I, I would go to to a very interesting uh, paragraph I read from you uh, one day, precisely after the invasion on uh, around the halls implications of Russians' invasion of Ukraine, and you wrote that uh, very compelling that history did not end with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 or the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. There are hard realities that the Soviet succession remains open ended. And the continent as a wall remain tempestuous, dynamic, and prone to instability. The United States and Western Europe will not escape the ripple effects of turmoil in Eastern Europe. Obviously, you, you have been talking about this, but uh, and without doing this futuristic or a commander exercise that we don't want to. Uh, but obviously, we all read uh, Fukuyama and of history, and uh, of, we have been reading in a lot of articles about this and how contradictory it can be. Uh, my question is, what will be the next written pages on, on history? It's an open book. What is your, your perception of, on, on it? Well, that's a big question. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I stick to what I have said that, um, you know, if we think about 1989, when the Berlin Wall came down, uh, in Europe, of course, we were focused on the, the hugely positive news story that that was. It was about uh, Europe coming back together again after decades of Cold War uh, and then the aftermath of two world wars. And that, that was the story. That was the paradigm for the next 30 years that Europe was sort of putting itself back together again. It was, and it was creating a magnetic um, dynamic that other countries, you know, it would continue to expand this space of stability and a democracy, market economies that other co countries could join, join in. The EU kept enlarging. There would be a place for more East European countries, the Balkans. Russia would find some place there. The United States would continue as this sort of benign, supportive power, not get in the way too much. Um, that paradigm is over uh, in all of its regards. China was supposed to be a responsible stakeholder. Uh, uh, we have to adjust to the world we're in, and that is a world that is, uh, as I say, an age of disruption in which you have a revisionist China, uh, you have a revanchist Russia. And I hope in my country, we had a, a United States that was also questioning some principles of the international order under Donald Trump. I think uh, Joe Biden is the opposite of that. Uh, but we're having you know, huge fights in our country too about our future direction. So it's hard to predict. And Europe has to live with the fact that those three main protagonists for it are all questioning their own roles in the international system, uh, which means I think the premise of my, you know, if I have, and I've done this in the past, you know, if you're a policymaker, what's, what's your beginning point? Is Europe stable or is it fragile? Uh, and my my out you know my in, in going notion is it's a fragile place. Uh, the idea of ever closer union is at question. Uh, some of the basic principles of the European Union are being challenged, not only from without but from within. Um, and so uh, we have to construct our policies 
with a, this dynamic fluid you know fractured europe uh, in mind rather than some notion that it's sort of the rock you know the stable rock upon which we can uh move move policy i think we have to think the opposite uh, uh and i think the united states going forward will be europe's central partner to getting through that process um and i hope that our country will stay the course uh in that regard uh, we have our own debates i think which are sometimes not appreciated in europe about whether you know we should leave europe to the europeans why should we care why should we bother i just through our experience i think through the last hundred years whenever we tend to ignore our interest in europe we always pay a higher price later so I think it's it's in our own interest to be fully engaged, uh, but that's not a that's not a given. Uh, so uh, we have to uh, you know work together. That's why I say pointing to how deeply connected we are across the Atlantic uh, reinforces this notion. It's not just something nice to do to work together. It's actually quite fundamental. Europe without the United States is going to be far more turbulent and fractured than if. The, it has the United States standing with it as a partner. Okay, okay. Professor Hamilton was our last question. I, I thank you very much for, for your time, uh, for the discussion and coming to our podcast. It was a truly pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Take care. Take care. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to our podcast. We kindly invite you to subscribe to our podcast, which is available on Spotify, YouTube, and other platforms. You can also check out all the links and resources on the show's notes. That's all for this episode, folks, and we look forward to you tuning in next time. This was a Bloom Europa original. <laughs>